All right, welcome everyone. We are so excited to have all of our mentees here. So you're going to hear a bunch of different presentations on many different topics um, of the things that everyone worked on. So with that, I'm excited to introduce our MC for this, who is Greg Crow Hartman, um, a Linux kernel maintainer who needs no introduction himself. So Greg, take it away. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hey, I'm Greg. Um, I, Shua normally does this. Um, she couldn't make it, so I get to do this instead. Um, she runs the mentorship program for the Colonel. I've done it as well, but she's the one primarily in charge. Um, thanks for joining us. We have a whole bunch of different um, interns that have done projects, and it stopped. <laughs> uh, so let's just start. Um, starting things off is Prateet. Um, you did from Fontaine LLC. You did Powering Newcomers. Take it away. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the topic of the talk is going to be about empowering newcomers, how uh, juniors or the people who are new to the industry can uh, leverage these open source mentorship programs to excel in their career. And uh, that is what we will mostly talk about. I'll share my experience. Maybe people can have some takeaways of what they can do to improve as an engineer altogether. So yeah, let's get started. So I'll start with a little introduction of mine. My name is Pratik Singh. Uh, I'm a full-stack software engineer working at Fountain. I have been doing it for almost one and a half year now. And uh, I graduated from my college in August 2024. And for my LFX cohort, it was last year in September I graduated. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. And that I'll tell you a few things about it. So the project I worked for, its name is Tetragon which is an eBPF-based security observability and runtime enforcement tool. So if we talk about Celium altogether, Celium is like an umbrella uh, organization under which there are three major projects, Celium itself. Uh, then there's Hubble, which is uh, an observability-focused tool. And then we have Tetragon, which is observability as well as runtime enforcement. And uh, the new thing over here is that it's not using eBPF just to observe the system. You can also prevent certain things from happening altogether. Maybe few system calls, man messing up your file system. So you can prevent that altogether. So I'll talk about my issue. The issue was uh, removing certain Celium dependencies from the Tetragon project. So Tetragon depended on uh, a few things, specifically endpoint resource, uh, custom resource, which was very heavy for Tetragon to work with. Tetragon did not need all that information, but they did not have any other solution for that, and it was in-house for them, so they were depending on Celium for it. So the work was to find the dependencies, including Celium and other ones, and uh, find out a solution for it so that maybe we can implement something in-house for Tetragon so that it does not put so much load on the API altogether. So that was my issue. And uh, now the goals, because when I started, I had a few goals to begin with. Uh, the biggest one was, to actually understand how the project works, how things are connected, how a simple eBPF program can prevent certain system calls from happening and protect your system. So I wanted to, pro uh, I wanted to understand the project altogether, how it works. That was uh, one of the biggest goals. The other thing was, since it was the, pro the, the issue was quite exploratory in the beginning, we did not exactly know what the dependencies are. So I had to find those dependencies and uh, then I wanted a solution that actually is not flaky, it's not half worked. I wanted to implement a solution that actually solves that problem. So these were three major goals. Then it was about impl impl implementing a solution end to end. So it's not just me writing code and me writing tests. It was integrating the solution in the CI CD workflow altogether so that they can also be sure that the work that is happening is actually solving the problem. And yeah, one of the biggest things, communication. Uh, talking to the team, uh, Tetragon team uh, has some amazing engineers. I got to talk to them because of this uh, mentorship program. So yeah, these were the major goals. Now, what I learned, I have split this section into two parts, my technical focus learnings, and the other was non-technical ones, which I consider as important as the technical ones. So let's go through the technical ones one by one. The first one was, uh, understanding Kubernetes through a developer's perspective. So uh, when I started uh, learning about Kubernetes, it was very user-focused for me. 
I was interacting it. Uh, I was interacting with it using kubectl. Cube I was deploying uh, stuff on it. But it was through this specific issue I got to realize that actually how things are working internally, how code for Kubernetes itself works. So this was a new perspective for me. And uh, the other thing was working of the API uh, and control plane. So as I said, I was a full stack. I am a full stack engineer, and I built servers. But it was my first time interacting with Kubernetes API altogether, uh, how it worked internally. So that was also a great thing. And uh, infrastructure automation that was a domain that was that is very interesting to me to this day. And uh, I wanted to learn more about it, and I got to learn about it through this uh, mentorship, which I did. Then extending Kubernetes through CRDs. So Kubernetes project itself is like very big, but I got to learn that it is very extensible as well. I can extend it uh, working through CRDs and controllers, operators. So that was also a major thing to learn. It opened a lot of thinking space for me that, okay, we can do this as well. Then, yeah, testing. So as I said, the issue was to reduce the load on API that Tetragon was having through because of Cilium. So, I got to load test uh, the in-house uh, solution we built for Tetragon, and it really did work well. And finally, the CI-CD workflow that I delivered, it was integrated into the solution, and I got to learn about it as well. And then the non-technical stuff was about how open source communities work, uh, how we collaborate, how, how, how do I talk to people over there, things like that, and then asking the right questions, that also matters, and uh, feedbacks. Feedback, taking feedbacks from your mentors and improving all the way. So, yeah, the biggest uh, achievement I had was all the contributions were merged and the issue was closed. So, I'll just take a few seconds to explain the journey. I did not know a lot, about, a lot about the solution altogether, but I had this mindset that I don't know much, but I can learn quickly and implement the solution. So, uh, I sent an email to my mentor that, I'm not very experienced. This is my first time interacting with the project. What are the things I can read or learn? Should I stop? Yeah, one more minute will work. Okay, so yeah. So the first email was just asking what actually should I read? And luckily he replied. And uh, it all started from there. I read a few articles. I read an entire book for it. And uh, I gained experience through it. Then I, write, uh, and then I wrote a proposal. I got the feedback, I integrated it into the previous proposal, and then the implementation begins because I was selected for it. I wrote the CRD, there was separate PRs for everything. I wrote the controller tests, and then integrated into their CI-CD workflow. So yeah, the solution was delivered. I still contribute to the project to this day, and I'm learning more and more about eBPF every day. And just a few takeaways of being a good mentee. Just be curious, ask questions, give like take some time to understand things. And uh, be fully invested. Like, if you want to do it, maybe you have to invest more than five hours some days. But yeah, you can do it. And uh, learn by doing. Write your solutions. I was writing a controller uh, outside of my mentorship program altogether just to test a few things. So you can do that as well. And communication is very important. You must talk to your maintainers. You must ask for like what are the expectations. And if you have some more uh, things to implement and you have time, Talk to your mentors, maybe they'll help you out some, uh, with some more work if you want. So yeah, these were some takeaways. Uh, the things that I, I'm going to do next is I'm going to learn about eBPF more. I'm going to explore the infrastructure automation domain more. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Pratik. Um, next is Asmit. Yeah. Uh, From Bios, Bios, Bios. Um, speaking about um, creating new identities for Oras. Um, so, hello everyone, my name is Asmit Malkanavar, and I'm a product designer by profession, currently working at Byers, and um, this, is, this was my LFX mentorship project about uh, designing and developing a new Oris website and giving Oris the brand identity that it has today. Uh, 
so i'll give you a basic overview of what the project is so oris is oci registry as storage that provide CLI and uh, client libraries to distribute artifacts and it supports various registries such as GitHub registry, AWS, uh, Azure and Docker. Uh, and then so my project was basically uh, designing and developing a website for them and also giving them a new brand and identity. So these were the initial issues that I found. Uh, uh, it didn't had any landing page whenever you visited their website you would just straight up go to the first page of the documentation so from that it uh, really didn't have any uh, like message of what the project does uh, then there were various challenges in uh, maintaining version documentation as it was using some old uh, python framework for the documentation and there was uh, unstructured documentation layout where you would have to uh, navigate a lot uh, in the website to find a particular documentation and there was no seo optimization so whenever you would search oris on the internet it would uh, pop up some random website and there was a lack of uh, cohesive brand identity. So this was my basic uh, design process where I talked to my mentors, uh, created some ideas and then the next stage was research where I talked with various project maintainers and uh, various people from CNCF organization on what they expect to see on the website, uh, any animations, any graphics, uh, what kind of uh, information they would like to present. Then after that, uh, I created a few prototypes on Figma and then I myself developed it using uh, DocuSaurus uh, and React. And yeah, it was uh, de deployed by the end of my uh, mentorship program. So uh, for research and analysis, I looked into CNCF landscape and there were like hundreds of projects. And for, uh, I explored projects such as Harbor, Dragonfly, Kubernetes. And I also initiated co uh, conversations with the project maintainers and new contributors who were aiming to contribute to the project and what difficulties they were facing while uh, doing so. So uh, these were the findings, like uh, many CNCF maintainer wants uh, their website to be uh, very minimal with just uh, right information to show on the page, no fancy graphics, no fancy animations. And then uh, the, we discussed that the website should show a basic home page, adopters page, which would include which projects are using ORUS and uh, uh, what adopters uh, that Oris is supporting, a uh, blog page to show the all uh, project updates and uh, uh, there was also a need of architecture or a flow diagram to show on the website uh, that would help new users to uh, gain like better understanding of the project and a community section is always important for open source projects as you gain new contributors from that section. So. Uh, I helped in designing and uh, implementing that in the new website as well. And the target audience for this website is obviously new and experienced contributors. So uh, these were some early uh, black and white prototypes and as you can see it's not that pretty <laughs> and uh, these went through multiple iterations and after that uh, this version was finalized which uh, shows what, what uh, you know companies are contributing to the project, how you can get involved with it, and a short like YouTube video uh, showing uh, what Oris does. So yeah, and uh, here are the here are the features that was were enhanced in the new version. So there was a dark mode uh, version support because uh, everyone most of them prefer dark mode then there was organized documentation since we use docusaurus docusaurus itself uh, has a very detailed uh, guide on how you can organize documentation how to version them uh, and yeah there was a visual refresh and then we also added search functionality so you can easily search uh, what you want uh, using algolia seo improvements when you now search oris project uh, the second or third link would pop up with the uh, website and uh, there was this new adopters page which uh, included what projects are using Oris and yeah, uh, what projects are uh, using Oris and uh, how you can adopt uh, Oris into your organization and there were uh, accessibility improvements so uh, by accessibility I mean that the information that is present on the website should be accessible to all uh, people even with like visual impairments 
So that was uh, taken care of and uh, page speed improvements whenever you load the website should like load quickly. And of course the community section where you can uh, engage with Oris project, join the Slack channel and even attend uh, Oris bi-weekly meetings. Uh, you can read the full case study on this uh, QR code. Uh, you can scan and you can like read the entire case study. And uh, yeah, this was my LFX mentorship project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yasmin? Yeah. Next up is Depasha. Nafisa. Same laptop? Yeah. Okay, yeah, another ORAS presentation. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, I'm Dipesha Burse. I'll be presenting on navigating the Orosphere. Um, my project was on this, my mentorship was on the same project as Asmet's, it was on Oris. Um, so I had to restructure the technical documentation and work on some new documentation for this project. And yes, I will be walking you through what all I worked through. Uh, so first and foremost, my mentors were Terry Howe and Femin Zhu. Both of them helped me a lot throughout the process, um, especially because I had a huge learning curve. I did not know everything. So pointing me in the right direction, giving me different resources to read. Um, yeah, they were really helpful. I had done the summer term, which was for 12 weeks. So the main three objectives that I had was um, lowering the barrier for entry for new users, um, organizing information more clearly, and making the documentation more accessible and up-to-date. So what I had noticed for um, the ORIS project was there was a lot of information and a lot of documentation, but it was not structured in such a way that if someone is new to the project, they would be able to understand where to go and how to navigate through the page. So the main goal was to make it, uh, structure it in such a way that people are able to access the right information at the right place and make it easy for people. Um, now new users can obviously be um, someone who does not know much technically or and they are new to the project or someone who is familiar with the technicalities but uh, they're just new to that specific project. So what I did was I just listed down the current structure. Um, we focused on using the diet access framework wherever we could. And then I proposed a different structure wherein it was a lot easier for people to find the information that they needed. So um, this was the approach that we used. So diet access framework for anyone who does not know, we usually have four kinds of guides. We have tutorials which are learning based, uh, how to guides which are more goal oriented, uh, explanations are majorly for understanding and references are pure information. So once we have um, all of this in place, um, my main job was to categorize what information should go in which, which category so that it would make everything a lot more structured. So this is what I did. I proposed a documentation directory structure like it was in the previous slide. Um, a lot of this was research. I had to learn a lot. I had to implement it. Um, of course, before writing any kind of new documentation, you need to know your material. So um, yeah, I, I learned a lot. I read a lot. And then once I knew how to implement it, I could work on writing documentation that would be easy for people to understand, even if they were new to the topic. Um, so these are the things that we worked on. Uh, this is just a list of things that you know we did. Um, but to put it briefly, this is a screenshot of how I restructured all of the documentation. So we had a quick start guide immediately, which was not there previously. The installation was, I think, under uh, introduction. 
which was a little hard to find if someone's new to the project. Um, we had how-to guides like the diet access framework, the ORIS commands, client libraries, everything was a little more understandable and easy to um, reach. Uh, of course, these are all of the PRs that I had. Uh, we also added a glossary at the end. Um, when we were researching on how to do things, we also referred to the documentation of Helm, which we found extremely helpful. So um, when we researched a lot of topics and a lot of projects, we understood how documentation should be. We picked up the things that we really liked about it, and that's how we executed it. Yeah, and that's that. Uh, I'm Dipesha Burse. I am currently a developer advocate. and. Uh, yeah, this was what I worked on at the Oris project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, um, SK. Yeah. Right. And this is a little different uh, about securing your containers or container projects. Okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshay Aikwad. I'll be uh, talking about my work as a uh, LFX mentee last year. Um, so mostly um, about about the like uh, the title. Uh, you'll get to know uh, what I've worked and how can you uh, implement that in 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 your projects. Uh, so basically, it's about uh, the OCI hooks and um, how can you avoid some security issues in your project. So a bit about myself. Uh, I'm uh, Akshay Gaikbat. Uh, I'm basically an open source enthusiast. Um, I'm a uh, senior product uh, engineer at InfraCloud. Um, yeah, last year I, I was a, a LFX mentee uh, for a Cubarman project. And um, when I was not working, I uh, do um, sketches, drawing, things like that. A uh, bit about the project that I work on, Cube Armor. So um, Cube Armor is basically a, a runtime uh, run Kubernetes security engine. Uh, it uses eBPF and uh, L uh, LSM, which is uh, Linux security modules, um, to um, fortify um, the, uh, the workloads uh, based on your um, container, or cloud containers, or on your iOS or um, sorry uh, IoT or edge uh, environments, um, it basically enforces policy-based uh, controls um, for your project. Uh, the project work that I have done. So basically, um, the, I have worked on uh, two issues mainly. Uh, one of them is um, basically storing uh, Cube Armor uh, policies in OCI registries. Okay, so uh, for that. Part um, basically, uh, if if you so basically, if, if you have the project uh, which is containerized, and if you want to have some policy or anything, or if you want to, which you have the policies which you want to um, um, use for your project, you can push and pull it from uh, along with your uh, project when you push it to the registry. So it's like uh, we are uh, there is a Kubernetes CLI which uh, which I have supported to use the push pull verify uh, mechanism. To, uh, to your uh, policies. And the second uh, issue that I've worked on is uh, leveraging OCI hooks for um, this container event. So Armor uses um, uh, basically watch the events um, that are happening on container, like uh, starting container or stop, container stop, um, or delete. And um, and internally, it just uses the um, the sockets um, like um, the Unix socket, like um, the Docker or um, Cryo or Container D. 
So it uses that socket, it mounts that socket um, in, in the in the cube armor environment, and um, and then it, it uses to um, get the events successfully uh, for the container um, um, lifecycle. Uh, but the problem here is like um, it's not um, a good practice uh, in terms of security to uh, mount the um, socket um, into into the container. So hence, uh, it was proposed to use OCI hooks, uh, which is a new thing um, to uh, not quite new. Uh, to listen to your uh, events uh, for, for of your containers, <clears throat> and uh, many times, uh, many um, policy enforcers they they doesn't allow you to mount the uh, uh, the sockets um, in in the container. You just uh, restrict that thing. So, which is like basically, if you uh, if you get if you want to get rid of that um, that mechanism and uh, use something different to uh, get the events uh, that we uh, wanted in cube armor. Okay, um, some of my learnings. Um, yeah, as I said, like exposing Sierra sockets was um, the security risk. Um, and then um, I was quite new to the OCI hooks. I started um, um, learning, uh, like basically doing different uh, research and uh, search on OCI hooks. And how uh, how it helps in mitigating the risk that, um, that I just talked about, um, and basically, yeah, yeah we, we are uh, we want to leverage the OCI hooks to uh, listen to container events. Yeah, um, bit of my experience um, working as an LFX mentee. Um, so these are uh, the mentors that I work uh, work work with: uh, Barun, uh, Ankur, Rahul, and Anurag. They were quite uh, helpful uh, in terms um, of um, guiding me in, in the proper direction. Um, uh, we usually have like a weekly mentoring call where we discuss um, our progress and um, we, we um, talk uh, things about how, how uh, what are the updates. And we also have like um, back and forth conversation about the uh, the work that we are doing. Um, and like. Um, as, as this is like uh, completely new to me, um, the project as well as the um, uh, the different um, tools that I was using. So we, I had faced multiple challenges, and um, I always had a discussion with with my mentors um, uh, very quickly to get um, get through that challenge and uh, what is the path um, forward. So, for example, um, we were doing some research. What else uh, we could use um, instead of like OCI hooks? And there are some other options like Pod Informers or um, there is FN Notify um, thing, which we uh, we discussed. We had an um, like different um, uh, case study that we did, and then we come to the, to the point. Mm, yeah. So about the like uh, that's about like the work that I've done. Uh, in terms of like future uh, scope of this uh, project, so OCI, OCI hooks was uh, natively supported by um, Cryo and uh, Container D. Um, at least Cryo has a, has a has a very good integration with OCI hooks, uh, but like um, it lacks some um, support uh, supportability in in Docker. So that is something um, we have to work on, um, and. As, as a part of uh, project, since uh, there are a lot many um, uh, and, uh, like research that I have to do, I wasn't able to complete the whole um, um, issue or close the issue. Uh, hence, we had like uh, continuation of the work, and where I get a chance to mentor others to um, help them implement the work or the implement the design that I propose. So it, it's, uh, it's a very good um, um, opportunity for me to mentor um, others as well, um, just like how um, uh, my mentors help me. Um, yeah, so a bit of uh, the references, like uh, I have, uh, wrote a blog post, uh, which you can check on uh, akshayji.in. And this, this is the project uh, website, cubearmor.io. Um, do check it out uh, to learn more about uh, Cube Armor. And yeah, we are open to contributions. Um, uh, feel free to drop by. Yeah, that's uh, all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Songa. Um, a case study about Cube's case.
Hi everyone, welcome to this my talk. Today I will show you how we achieve fully automated uh, release and co-review with ICD Aguscape, an LFX mentorship project during 2023 spring term. First, let me give a brief self-introduction. I'm Song Lin Jiang, and I'm currently a doctoral researcher at our university in Finland, working on machine learning systems and databases. I'm also an alumnus of Seculo, which is an Erasmus Mundus master's program in security and cloud computing. Additionally, I'm a passionate free software advocate. During my leisure time, I maintain several open source projects and contribute to many others. At Goodscape community, I was once a mentee of the LFX, LFX mentorship and also a contributor. I refer to myself as Hello Man on the internet. If you are interested, you can find me on GitHub, on the LinkedIn, and on the X. Now we are going to talk about the second part, which is an introduction to the release engineering I help with at Goodscape. We integrated the release process into the CI/CD that Kubescape uses, which is a GitHub action. Whenever the maintainer decides to push a Git version tag to the Git repository, the GitHub actions will be triggered. And then we can have a new release of Kubescape. The release process at Kubescape involves building, testing, and packaging software and components. As Kubescape is a Golang program with C bindings, we also want to support cross collab compilation so that we can build for multiple platforms or multiple architectures. We also make Kubescape available for common package managers and enable bumping those versions in the packaging scripts automatically. In this way, users can resolve new releases without any manual upgrades. My contributions help reduce manual intervention and minimize human error, which enables frequent releases as well as faster feedback and time to market. Now let's discuss the last part of this talk, which is to show you how we make Kubescape capable of automatically performing GitHub code reviews. First, let's take a look at the workflow for this process. When the de developer newly opens or pushes code to a pull request or a repository on GitHub, a predefined GitHub Actions workflow will be triggered to run the Kubescape. The Kubescape will run a scan on the code files in search of misconfigurations and generate the report in the static analysis result interchange format. The files can be uploaded to GitHub security if the developer pushes it to the main branch directly so that maintainers can be alerted for possible vulnerabilities. Or if it's a pull request, the file will be forwarded to the review doc using the converter I help write so that it can be converted into the review dog diagnostic format. The review dog then is in charge of generating reviews for the code fixes suggestions by committing with a new review. To support those fixed suggestions, I help add the fixed object support for the Kubescape generated sub report. Here is a demo showing what it looks like for the automatic GitHub code reviews. Users can apply fixes generated from the Kubescape directly by clicking, clicking the commit suggestion button here. That's all about my main contributions. Aside from this, I was also involved in other issues and had a highly productive and fulfilling experience working on the Kubescape project. The mentorship program allowed me to make substantial contributions to the Kubescape project and collaborate effectively with my mentor and the community, enhancing my skills and knowledge in the process. I'm proud that I can have such kind of an experience. Thanks again for coming and listening to this talk. Now I'm researching machine learning systems and databases. If you are also interested in large language models training and inference, or vector and graph databases for retrieval augmented generated generation systems. Let's connect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, Javier. <laughs> uh, it's going to talk about hey, kernel stuff. All right. That's it. 
Not that the other stuff isn't okay, too. <laughs> well, all of our favorites. <laughs> Right, so well, welcome to this very short story about that, an adventure through a Linux kernel. It sounds a bit epic, but if you want to compete to, against AI to convince new developers to join the Linux kernel, you have to, you have to you need some hype, right? So who am I? Well, regular developer. It's not about me, this, this presentation. So the important thing is that I'm a Linux kernel contributor, and I want to convince other people to join the community. So let's start this adventure. Well, first. Why would you start this? By the way, there are many random pictures of myself. Just yes, if you get bored, you can just take a look at the pictures. So, well, there are many reasons to join the Linux kernel. It's a big project. It's a, there's a passionate community behind it. So there are many reasons, but for me, the most important is that it's fun because it's the sweet spot between the hardware and the software. And just that community is really passionate. So you will have fun joining this project. What you need to, to start the project, what you need to pack for this adventure, not much. Just need the code, some documentation, official documentation. There's lots of stuff online and some very basic tools, a compiler, some editor. And if you're a beginner, maybe some static analysis tools so you don't mess up that much. You will mess up anyway, but maybe not that much, right? Don't spend too much time like configuring plugins and stuff that you're not going to use. So just get the basic stuff you need at the beginning and then you will pull the pun. So there's a there's a shortcut to learn to learn to learn about the kernel, which is the, the Linux kernel mentorship program from now on LKMP, so we can save some time. So this is a this is a great opportunity to to shorten your learning curve because you will learn from mentors, from experienced people, and you will get more productive than, as, than if you learn by yourself. Here's some some advice if you want to join the program. We don't have much time for it, so. You, will, you can take a look when, when it gets uploaded. So one, two, three, next. So if you don't, if you don't join the, the program, it doesn't matter. Most of the developers don't know anything about this program, but still you can learn everything online. So everything is online. Just, just need passion, dedication, and some goals. But it's not as epic as getting out of a crevasse, but you, you, get, you get the point, right? So some goals, well, the, the Linux kernel is huge. Don't try to, to learn everything about it. Just focus on sub, some subsystems. It's dividing different subsystems. Get some that you like, that you find interesting, and start reading the documentation, fixing simple bugs. Just learn the workflow and start sending things upstream. So you will learn the basics, and then you can start sending maybe more interesting things. But the thing is that you start right away sending basic stuff. Some, some ways to, to send things upstream. There's, there are some tools like Syspot. This is an amazing tool, awful logo, by the way. But you know, with this tool, you can you can fix bugs that can be even ported to a stable kernel. So your contributions will will impact many people. Other options you have: programming new devices, new drivers, new features. It's it might be no more fun. You will have more interactions with the community. And for example, you can have very simple. Very simple um, setup with what well, system on chip, like a Raspberry Pi, some drivers for 30 euros. You can become a Linux driver programmer and learn embedded Linux as well. So when you start contributing to the kernel, you will have many interactions with the community. You will get feedback. You will send new versions, and you will learn a lot along the way. So yeah, you will you will have to care about some things that people care in the kernel, like don't send. SML, emails, and things like that. And in the end, eventually, your patches will get applied. And as simple as that, you have become a Linux kernel contributor. So congratulations. This is an ex very example, very simple. I didn't know anything about the kernel one and a half years ago. And now I have, like, I don't know, a couple of couple hundred patches. Because you, if you like it, you don't, you don't count anymore how many patches you're doing. You're just doing because you like it, even in your free time, because most of them are made as, a, as a hobbies, like 80% of them maybe. And well, how can you continue this adventure? You can bring other people into the kernel. So for example, I was, I was a co-mentor at the LKMP. So I was helping other mentees like you guys to join the kernel, but you don't have to do it through the LKMP. So you can just 
bring some workmates, some friends, people you know. And well, the goal is, is this adventure never ends. So you stay around, we want you to stay around to keep on contributing. Maybe you can make a live out of it. You can work for a company. There are many companies at this event looking for Linux kernel developers, I hope. And otherwise you can just do it as a, as a hobbyist as, a, as I do. And well, either way your adventure will be unique. And here comes the promo. Mine continues as a hacker backpacker. What does it mean? I'll be traveling from Europe to Central Asia so far. That's what, I, what I've planned so far. And I want to keep on contributing to the Linux kernel. And I want to meet other contributors, other people who live more or less in those countries. Just reach out. It will take me a while to get there. But if you want to share ideas, just reach out. And that's it. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, next up is Azish. Uh, talk about Carvel. So hey, good evening everyone. Um, I am Ashish and today uh, I'll be sharing my experience uh, in LFX mentorship program under Kavil and uh, how it impacted me and my journey beyond and further. So yeah, let's go. So this is me. Uh, I'm currently an undergraduate at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Roadkey. I'm a developer at SGS Labs. It's just a it's just a club of people who uh, make open source projects. Um, I have been an LFX mentee in the year 23. Um, I just recently did Google Summer of Code. These are some of my interests. I really like cloud native technologies, DevOps. I also do backend developments in Go, C++, JavaScript uh, with a language preference in order. <laughs> and uh, uh, with my mathematics background, I really enjoy zero knowledge proofs and as such. So yeah, uh, let's get into it. So Kaval. So let me tell you a bit about Kaval philosophy. What does it, what is exactly Kaval? So the problem that Kaval is fixing is basically to give you smaller tools to solve problems, which can later compose to solve a bigger problem. So this is what uh, uh, it means to have a Unix philosophy of building things. So that's why Kaval has these seven set of tools, which are CLIs and controllers. So you can basically like uh, use them uh, independently and then you can combine them in a workflow to solve a bigger problem. So uh, there are very less leaky abstractions. Coming to the tool which I used, it was image package. It basically packages, distributes and uh, relocates your Kubernetes configuration. So you, if you want to distribute a package, so an image, YAML files, everything. So you use this image package tool, you bundle it, you bundle it up into a neat artifact and then you ship it out. Uh, this is, you can include it in your workflow, anyone can use it, or you can use, use it with the Kaval tools as well, as you can see in the, uh, in the image below. So uh, what was exactly my issue which I tackled here? So this is one of the features of image package. What it does is basically you are copying from one repo to another repo, but uh, the but the use case is that while copying, it will also copy all the dependency dependencies of the images which this image depends on. So this way you will have all, everything which you need in one repository. So this is kind of very helpful in an air gapped environment. So. Uh, the issue which I solved was we wanted to uh, create something like uh, creating an OCI tar from the uh, final repo. So initially it was suggested that uh, we could take the final repository and simply create an OCI artifact uh, from tools such as Crane and as such. Uh, but I tackled it in some other, another way. So this is how Crane pulls your OCI image. So if there is an OCI image, you simply pull it out. And this Crane is a very popular tool, if people don't know, uh, maintained by Google. You can use it for image manipulations and as such. So uh, it will pull your images such as this. But it does not support multiple recursive image pulling as such. So this, uh, here is my first learning, first three learnings. First, don't underestimate yourself. My initial project was just to uh, pull the image from the 
final repository. But after looking at the whole over workflow, I suggested and we all discussed that it is rather uh, extremely important for us to include it in the image package workflow as such. So now you can actually use from the first repo, which I showed you in the previous slide uh, with the original image, and you can directly create an OCI tar with the recursive images as well. And don't underestimate, sorry, don't overestimate yourself. This is important because uh, even though I have an uh, idea and plan in view, I do not have the expertise uh, of what to do right now. So it is very, very, very important for me to communicate with the mentors. And that's what I did. I had an idea, I communicated with them and talked to them, is it even possible? Should I do? What should I approach? And we figured out a plan and we did. And the next learning which I had was be self-reliant. Mentors are human beings as well. So you need to first of all learn what to learn, how to learn, get a roadmap, and then see through it. Your main focus should be learning things and not just completing a product, uh, project as such. So yeah, this is what we did. We defined a scope, we made a roadmap, we made weekly goals, uh, separated things on priority basis and stuff like that. Um, Last learning, don't be afraid to redo things. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing, but I rewrote my code once and I threw it all into a dump because it wasn't working the way I expected it to be. But this is something which I learned and this is a lesson which I'll focus in all of my life that you need to chase for perfection. If it works correctly, then only you need to ship it. So these are some technical learnings to include. I learned building images from scratch again. Uh, I had a problem, uh, but I understood that I need to deep dive into it. So I totally went into the process of how images are built, building one from scratch, and difference between OCI images, artifacts, and the importance of OCI compliant ecosystem, how some registry does not support, and the feud between different companies, which I will not name, but okay. Then writing CLIs in Go, build kit internals, which is a very popular tool. Uh, Docker uses it behind the scenes, and yeah. So the journey beyond, since the talk of my topic is the journey beyond, how LFX mentorship helped me after the LFX mentorship. So I went into the depths of what I was already learning, uh, such as image building. Then I leveraged what I learned, uh, which was image building. And I worked on some startups. Then I went on to read Bill Gate internals, their docs. And my Google Summer of Code project was also in Metagol, which was basically to use Bill Gate and image optimizations and as such. And I started building personal projects. I st started learning a lot. And I started finding like-minded people. I joined CNCF communities in my areas. I, I was a founding member and DevOps co-lead in my college. And I, we are building Katana at SGS Labs. It is just a club, but it's a first of its kind attack and defense CTF platform in Kubernetes. So these are the stuff which everything started and the root is LFX mentorship. I would not be here if uh, I, I did not do that. And that is what I wanted to uh, encapsulate through my presentation that just one thing, one roadmap, and if you do it correctly and you learn and the learnings are in the stepwise, you can achieve a lot and like, so yeah, that's it. Uh, what next? So yeah, I'll, I'm happy to meet two like-minded people. I'm also gonna deep dive into Docker and image building optimizations as such, and completing open source projects. I'm also looking for challenging opportunities to work on. So if you have any, please contact me. Uh, this is my GitHub. You can find the slides, and this is my LinkedIn. I go by the name Aspect everywhere on the internet. You'll easily find me. So yeah, uh, I'd like to thank my mentors and Linux Foundation and CNCF. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Next up is uh, Pranesh. No. Okay. <laughs> Talking about um, Zo and transformations.
<coughs> Hello. Hi, hi, everyone. So let me start. I'm Priyansh Mehta, uh, currently an upcoming software engineer at Flipkart. And I have been a project maintainer at Opia Foundation and in my final year of college. So yeah. So little bit about myself. Yeah. From the very start of my college, I have been experimenting and trying out different things and like love to play with things and see how they work out. Uh, initially, I tried to learn things through courses and all, uh, all uh, taking tutorials, but I saw like that never worked out for me. So this is how I started my journey. I started contributing to Opia Foundation, my first ever organization. And within three months, I was so good in things that after within a duration of five months, I became that the project maintainer itself. So I guess I believe ki, uh Contributing to open source programs is really, really a great thing. And you get to learn and by doing. You get to learn everything by doing, by experimenting. So coming to the thing, as we all are really short of time today. So this was the project that I did, diving into Zoe App Store and how OSS transformed me. I would really say that open source software has a very big role in whatever, how the career played out for me. It helped me in so many things. So to start it out, uh, like I assume you guys are all like me, who never knew what Zoe and open mainframe is. I'm assuming that. So these are the mainframe systems that you see very classical, old, modern, modern, I won't say, very classical, big metal machines that are used to process a lots of data. Okay, they are used to process lots of transactions, ATM transactions and data processing they are used. So the thing, the problem they have is they are running the legacy ZOS on them and you have to uh, use terminals to actually interact with those. Isn't that very boring? Like today we all are using, using so many UIs, GUIs that we actually won't be able to use a terminal. So that's why Zoe is this. This is what Zoe did it provided a complete interface to mainframe, ZOS. Zoe provided a complete interface. Okay, so just a question. You might all be wondering, yeah, uh, we have our individual computers, we have our gaming machine, I have a gaming laptop, and why, why in the world today do we need a mainframe? This was my exact question to my mentor, like why do we need a mainframe when we have so good machine? Why is it still needed? So to quickly sum it up, this is uh, like the first you saw, that is the mainframe. The sports car is actually our gaming laptop. And this is pickup van is a normal, uh, what do you say, a personal computer. The difference being a mainframe can actually uh, transform or like, uh, uh, like process a lot of data at a single point of time. It can carry that megabytes, terabytes of data and process it. It can, it has so many cores running in parallel with one another. But on the other hand, our gaming laptops and individual PC, they are served to serve a single customer. My gaming laptop will only serve me. It can't serve millions of transactions at a time. That is not possible for it. Same with the uh, user laptop. So I guess you guys understood why we still need a uh, mainframe. We have so many transactions, ATM transactions, and everywhere, data going from here to there, A to B, B to C. So we definitely need, still need a mainframe, and we don't want to change the existing ZOS there because it is legacy system and it has been tried and tested. So whatever we build, we built a Unix level over it. Okay, so just a quick demo, uh, what we did. I don't have a very uh, clear video with me currently. I tried to find it out. So this is the Zio, uh, Zio, actually Zoe, which is communicating with the mainframe. So what we did, okay. The thing is Zoe is more like a Windows for mainframe. Windows for ma mainframe, it is an operating system for mainframe. So what I did, there are a lot of application that you can install on ZOS, lot of but there was no such direct way. How will you install it? You have to write multiple big commands. So what my mentorship project was all about, it was making this app store. Here in this app store, there all the applications, plugins are listed. The developer just has to click install and the following plugin will be installed on the mainframe, the traditional big machine that we all discussed about. So it will automatically get installed. Now, okay, that's cool, yeah it will get installed, but uh, high level design, you might be asking what's the magic running behind this. So to sum that up, let's see. 
the thing is this is the high level design i will try my best to keep it as simple as possible so the first you guys can see the virtual desktop the zoe desktop this is all the front end side of the thing whenever a user or clicks on install update or search what happens I, we have a Z, zss server zss server zoe system server so what it does it calls a data service okay so data service is what data service is a way this is a unix part and this is a zos part unix and zos data service is what communicates in between it communicates between the zss and the mainframe system so i wrote that data service and that needed to be returned in metal c so what was done we have these commands you can see zwe commands run to install so whenever a particular call was made let's say install zwe install application name was run on the zos and the system was actually installed on the zos so to actually brief it up users calls on the front end side uh, it triggers the zss server we call the data service data service on the mainframe system runs these commands in the terminal and finally you get your plugin installed i guess you guys got a pretty basic idea uh, what it was and the how the whole high level design was all about okay so learnings to be very true i believe we all love, live in a world full of abstraction i myself have before this used python node for servers and all and i would say that is world full of abstractions you have so many things out there which is already done you just have to run start server and everything is already there you have a http server you have a json parser you have a rest api framework but when it came to c i got to know even to read a json file you have to somehow parse that in c and that is the mammoth of the task that was the hardest for me and it almost made me <laughs> it almost uh, break me down to understand that c so it was one of the biggest challenge during my mentorship uh, period but it took me around 1 to 1.5 months half the period of my mentorship but when i got to understand how everything was done coming from a abstracted world of python so then things made sense and i was actually able to write my own http server library which is used in gz and the world of abstraction and coming to see taught me a lot of thing trust me it taught me so many things from the bottom from the scratch level so definitely c is a thumbs up everyone if they get some experience they should code in c i would say after that you got to learn so many things so my feature has been not in my mentorship but after this one it got completely merged and is live currently and i'm really happy for that so yeah and a big thanks to my mentor lenny he has been like quite very helpful during this whole period of my mentorship like he was there and he like he used to provide me source codes like these are the codes you can understand because when i searched the whole youtube for c there was nothing there was no tutorial explaining you how to write code in c how to make a server there was no documentation to write even anything in metal c so lenny used to provide me some source codes key this was how it has been done till now and this is how you can do so his guidance has been invaluable i would say the best mentor i could have got so th big thanks to him and i won't bore you guys so that's all from my side these are the handles priyan 61 everywhere it is so thank you everyone thank you uh more mainframe stuff prince yeah Uh, hello everyone it's been an honor to be here my name is prince and 
I am here to share my journey with the project named Software Discovery Tool that I got privileged to work during last summer, 2023. So let me give you a brief about what is Software Discovery Tool. This tool make it easier for users to find specific Linux packages or other packages that are compatible with IBM's mainframe S390X architecture. I had the opportunity to contribute to the backend as well as the user interface, which was a fantastic experience. And here's a glimpse of how software discovery tool looks like. So like there are several checkboxes which you can select for different distributions and you can type in the package's name for exact or like uh, partial mat matches along with many other features. So core contributions that were made by me like was the MySQL backend implementations. So like we shifted from NoSQL to MySQL as the performance was like uh, it was getting slow day by day and this has made significantly improve the CPU usage as well as the data integrity. And the second was UI improvements and there are several functional fixes that were made by me. So here are some of the functional fixes that I did. So like the Fedora files, like I found out that the Fedora data files are saved under the wrong version name due to a simple Python for loop error. So like uh, the Fedora 38 files were saved as Fedora 37 files and the data for Fedora 37 was saved under Fedora 36. So it was a basic Python error, but all the files for Fedora are like uh, they were incorrect and due to which the users were getting wrong packages and although the fix was pretty easy, like we just have to remove that minus one and all the files were fixed. So like it was a basic error and another error that I fixed was this one uh, where the open source packages are empty. So like all of the data files of open source were empty. So what I found out the link that uh, we were using to scrape data was broken. So what we did uh, with my help of my mentor, we found a new link for the open source, but uh, we were still stuck. Uh, why? Because like we were facing problem for splitting the package name with this version. So my mentor connected me with Christian Bowles, who is a person working full time at OpenSUSE. So like he helped us with the splitting part and we fixed all the data files for that also. And uh, yeah, so like uh, this IBM validated software, uh, there was some pre-work done by my previous mentor, Arsh Pratap. And like I did some after work, uh, like creating script for developing particular data JSON files. And there were entries, like as you can see in the picture, uh, having null description and version. So they weren't any use. So like we removed all those entries and updated all the data files with the, like with all those invalid entries. And the major work that has been done was the shifting from NoSQL to MySQL as the, all the data files are pretty like same. Like we have the description name, package name and their versions. So it made sense to shift from no SQL to MySQL as they offer like faster querying. So like what we did and the no SQL was the, the CPU usage for no SQL was pretty high. As you can see in the upper picture, it was like going up to 99.7%. After switching it to MySQL, the performance, like uh, the CPU usage was around 50%. So yeah, we like improved a lot over here and like upcoming work, what would be like we'll be doing in the next mentorship. So like there's a major UI overhaul that we are like working right now. So like we are shifting from Angular to React as Angular uh, as React offers like it is scalable. It has so like it offers like great like for updating and real time updates are like really fast over there. And we are also working on automatic syncing between core and data repositories. Actually, we have dif two different repositories, like the main repository and the data repository. So like uh, they were like at my time, it, they weren't syncing. So like uh, we have this issue, it is still there. 
this mentorship so like they are working on that like uh, so the both are the repositories and they track each other and so like we have also a concern for separating out the back end and the front end as we, like we are uh, changing the front end from angular to react so they are pretty interconnected so yeah we are working on that and special thanks to my mentors elizabeth and arsh pratap they were always there and i have learned a lot from them and it was great working and so yeah i am i am still learning and still raising issues over there so yeah so i am still contributing to the team and uh, like i'm helping the new mentors and the mentees so uh, to get the same learning curve that i go through and here are the important links you can find uh, the website on sdt.openmainframeproject.org and here are the github links for the main repository and the data repository and here is the blog link for like that i have wrote down in the previous mentorship and thank you you can find me on linkedin princing thank you thank you prince thank you um next up is andrew yes. all right uh kernel bug fixing all right Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew, and uh, I participated in the Linux kernel bug fixing in 2023. So uh, I already had some experience prior to this mentorship. Uh, I tried different architectures and subsystems. Also, I used Linux security modules infrastructure. Moreover, I had some trivial patches uh, accepted into the mainline kernel. So uh, let me tell you more about the mentorship. Uh, in a nutshell, there are five steps uh, you should do. Find some uh, bug on Syscaller dashboard that you like the most. Reproduce and research what is wrong and why. Uh, fix it. Uh, find when it was uh, introduced and uh, which committed fixes. Describe everything and send to the maintainers. And repeat, looks quite easy, but actually it is not. You can f uh, fail right on step three. Uh, for example, you can make a wrong fix. Let's say you have a null pointed reference and uh, uh, you, you can just insert a check for a null pointer, right? But uh, it is a trivial fix, but it's not a proper fix, right? Uh, because you should dive uh, deeper and check uh, why the code was not expecting the null pointers there or there, uh, why uh, the pointer became a null pointer at all, and so on and so forth. So it may be quite uh, difficult sometimes, and surprisingly, the fixed step is, uh, is not long <laughs> comparing to the previous steps. Uh, when, uh, actually, when you know what you're doing and how you should fix it. Anyway, uh, let's move to my original goals, um, to the mentorship. I did not want to uh, make a trivial fixes, like a check, pack, check patch warnings or uh, documentation changes and so on. I wanted to make at least five patches, uh, which fix something more important. And uh, I um, also wanted, decided to deal only with uh, reproducible bugs. That is not mandatory, actually, because but it is just uh, simpler to prove that your fix is actually uh, doing something and fix something, right? Uh, it, there is no 100% guarantee, of course, because you can stop reproducing to reproduce something, but the fix will be completely wrong. Okay, uh, I also wanted to try some new tools and uh, probably subsystems, uh, and of course, collaborate and have fun. So my results are presented on the slide uh, with the links. Uh, I have five minor bug fixes during the mentorship and a bunch of closed syscaller issues. So uh, I use some new tools, uh, syscaller, ftrace, and tracemd, uh, different kernel address memory sanitizers, uh, and uh, also some uh, cross-tool chains for debugging. 
Uh, that year we also had a hackathon, uh, bug fixing hackathon. And uh, so I collaborated with Yogesh and Manas. We formed uh, a team called Bug Busters. And we tried to do a teamwork on the kernel bug fixing. Actually, kernel bug fixing is not about much teamwork, but uh, uh, actually one of my patches is a result of this collaboration, so it, well, it was uh, quite productive, I would say. So my mentors in 2023 were Shua and Ivan. Uh, Shua was helping all the mentees during our weekly calls. Uh, Ivan helped her with that and also was the one who suggested the Hackathon initiative. Uh, there was also a secret mentor, Greg, who is also here. Uh, Greg was answering all our emails and watching us to uh, not produce something strange in the mailing lists, but also, well, actually it happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so I want to thank everyone involved and uh, this was an interest, really interesting experience and uh, thanks to the Linux Foundation for the opportunity to talk on the Open Source, open source Summit this year. I think that's it. And uh, thanks everyone, we singles. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was a mentor. <laughs> um, next up is Roshan from talking about the console to VS Code. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Roshan, and I'm currently working at MathWorks as a software engineer. Uh, my interest in works revolves around distributed systems, backend systems, uh, a lot of build systems, and developer tooling. And this project is uh, part of one of the developer tooling or developer productivity side. And yeah, so, so that's me, uh, by the way, yeah, doing my first tandem skydive in Miami uh, this year only. Yeah, a quick overview about the project. Uh, yeah, so this project uh, is about move to cube which falls under Conway organization. So uh, this is basically a tool which helps you re-platform your source code or any project into a Kubernetes platform. And the main goal of the project was to build a VS Code plugin for it. And yeah, so uh, this was my first time working with uh, editor of VS Code. Uh, built a lot of CLI tools, a uh, lot of interactive tools, but uh, not uh, particularly with VS Code or any kind of editor. So uh, one of the goals was to work, uh, learn about the internals. And yeah, the second goal was to build and publish my first VS Code extension. Uh, this was my first time I built a VS Code extension and we also shipped it in this project. And all, all of this I found while exploring the CNCF ecosystem. So yeah. Uh, so let's start with uh, understanding uh, part, uh, part of the VS Code interna internals. So uh, if you uh, basically break it down, there are four key parts. One is a uh, extension host process. This is a little different towards your main VS Code process. So such that your extensions run under this process and even if your extension crash crashes, your main VS Code is not affected by it. Uh, then you have LSPs. I hope anyone working with editors or NeoVim or anyone, they are already aware about LSPs, your go to definition, jump to definition, everything is there. Uh, the Workbench API, this is something provided by the VS Code, which uh, gives you access to its uh, file system, so Windows, the UI access, uh, if you are building something uh, on the UI side like WebView, everything is uh, given access by the Workbench API. And then you have your uh, extension manifest. Uh, all of this is all the package.json file, which you find in any JS or TS project typically. But uh, this is where you define how your extension is going to ship, how your commands are going to look like, or how it's basically your uh, internal information and everything. So these are the four key parts about uh, VS Code internals. For our project, we weren't concerned about the LSP, but the, uh, the other three were very crucial. Uh, let's dive into the code parts of the uh, extension. 
So uh, on your right hand side, you have the extension.ts, which is basically your entry point to any extension. So as I mentioned about the extension host process, so this is where it starts. So when you start, so every time you trigger an extension, it starts with an activate function. This is where, you, this is the entry point, and after that, you just start writing your extension. So you can have any kind of functions or any kind of commands to find your, and similarly, you can have a de deactivate uh, function in your extension. And then uh, this is uh, the register command. This is where you start registering your command. So uh, any kind of action or any kind of event you want to happen in a uh, extension, so you have to register that. And on the right hand side, uh, sorry, on your left hand side, uh, is uh, where you define your manifest. Uh, you have all your metadata, like your which VS Code engine you're working on, your project uh, information, any kind of all the commands, what you're going to use. So this is where it resides. And a bit about uh, error handling and API integration, how you're going to do that in VS Code extensions. So uh, one of the key thing is uh, your extension is running in a background, so you might want to implement a very robust error handling strategies. Uh, because, and for that, uh, I have a sample code uh, on the side. I'll just show you a bit about it. First of all, there's this nice uh, API that you get, window.show error message. You have uh, everything falls under this window namespace. This is where you get access to your uh, editor's UI. And if you ever faced an error in extension, you will see something right popping on your right, right hand side bottom if you have used VS Code that is triggered by this API. So everything, if an operation failed and you want to let the user know, uh, this is the one you should use. Then, yeah, this is one of the main APIs which is used to execute commands. And then you have your file systems. Uh, the file systems in VS Code is a bit different. Uh, uh, it's typical, similar to Node file systems, but yeah, it has its own access, uh, the way it allows you access. Uh, and then you have your uh, asynchronous programming here. You can implement your async await and uh, any kind of async programming. So particularly for your long running operation. So not all uh, extension need to do a very quick operation. So the sam sample code on your right side is a for an uh, action which is very long running. So how are you gonna handle that? So you can have something like a cancellation token. So this is nothing but a signal if you have using some other kind of languages. Uh, it's, it's a way you signal a process is ended or is canceled. And then on an async, you just track on this uh, trigger. You can just do a cancellation. Oh, this has been triggered and you're canceling, uh, triggering a cancellation for your process. Uh, all of that was about the uh, backend part and the way you ship. And then now let's come into how you're going to handle the UI in VS Code extension. So you get two types of way you can uh, take care of the UI. Uh, one is basically having a typical uh, browser-like UI. Uh, VS Code provides you web view. Uh, you can bring in any kind of framework you use. For example, React, Svelte, anything you can bring into it. Since it's basically an electron, so you can just uh, run websites inside it. And the other one is the VS Code uh, the UI provided. If you see any kind of status bar, anything, all of that is from the VS Code side. Everyone has its own uh, like pros and cons. So the day, so you if you use the UI framework, you have higher development complexities. That means it's difficult for a single developer to manage. And for using context menu or something, it's very simple, uh, intuitive to the users. And I think most of the extensions, uh, you name it, mostly uses this. Uh, this is the extension action which we built. As you can see, this is the context menu on the side. This is the information it shows as soon as an action is triggered. This trigger creates a terminal process on the ba uh, background, which processes a lot of stuff. So now, as you can see, it gives you output where it's generated. So all of that is done in one flow. So yeah, the, that one is the option selector, and you can also provide. I'll just end in a minute. Uh, the tool which we used is, uh, so it can help you generate Kubernetes artifacts, so Helm charts and all. So these are the sample use cases. Uh, feel free to visit this site uh, to get how to install the tool, and uh, I have written a quick tutorial on how to use the extension along with a code sample. Uh, yeah, the experience was great. Uh, uh, I had two mentors, Hari Krishnan, uh, Hari Krishnan and Ashok. I mainly worked with Hari Krishnan. Uh, uh, the deliverability is we built and shipped the VS Code extension uh, within the project domain. Oops, and typo, it's error flows. Uh, and update mechanisms were done properly. And this was also pre presented in uh, IBM Research on a larger audience where we sh uh, showcased the demo. 
And yeah, a few of the aspirations I'm uh, exploring my works and interest are in distributed systems, storage systems. So I'm going to keep working on them and do some independent research work. I work as a backend uh, engineer primarily, and I'm more into scaling and optimizing network side. And yeah, working. I'm, I've been contributing to open source since uh, 2021. I've uh, been Google Summer of Code uh, fellow and all. So yeah, all of this. And yeah, I like adventurous sport. That's all. Feel free to connect to me on any of the uh, socials. Uh, you can scan the QR if you want to uh, get the information. Uh, that's all. Uh, I'll, and thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Next up is Yash talking about Prometheus. Hi, everyone. I'm Yash. Uh, I'm currently working as an SD intern at SciSelf, and I worked as an LFX mentee in the summer of 23, where I contributed to Cubescape. I was tasked for building a Prometheus exporter, which is also the title of my talk, Building a Prometheus Exporter from Scratch. So a quick overview of my project. Um, Cubescape, in their latest release, decided to store the config scans and vulnerability scans in the cluster rather than getting it from the platform. And uh, the project I was tasked to work on, the Prometheus exporter was supposed to scrape metrics from those CIDs and, uh, visualize using, and, and to visualize them using Grafana. Now, the tools I worked with for this project, was first one was obviously Cubescape. It is an open source Kubernetes security compliance tool built by Armo. Prometheus, which we need for the exporter to send metrics to and Grafana for obviously visualizing those metrics. Now, what are Prometheus exporters? Uh, those, they, they are agents which, are, which scrape uh, data from various sources and uh, present them in a manner Prometheus can understand. Now the question comes, why do we need exporters in the first place? So there's not a lot that can be achieved with a mo simple monitoring stack when your workloads are quite complex. And that's where exporters comes into play. So they help you scrape metrics from various data sources in your systems that a normal monitoring stack would not be able to do. And uh, that's why they are highly customizable and you can tailor them as per your needs. Now, how to actually build one? Now, I'll show you the architecture which I had for my project. Now, as you can see, we have the vulnerability scan CID here which is being monitored by the Prometheus exporter. And uh, these, this exporter exposes these metrics over a HTTP server, which is be, be, being periodically pulled by Prometheus and is later being visualized to a Grafana da dashboard. Now let's dive to the code part. Now, as you can see, now, as you can see, this is how we define the metrics, define and register the metrics. Here you can see that uh, I have several metrics in place like uh, cluster vulnerability high, low, and medium. Now these are just for example. And uh, if you focus on the new gauge part, it means that, uh, no, let me show you the next slide. Uh, so there are four types of Prometheus metrics, counter, gauge, histogram, and summary. Counter as uh, the counter is used when the metrics monotonically increases and it never decreases. And gauge we have for use cases where the metrics fluctuate which was my use case, and histogram and summary is for much complex use cases. So I use the gauge metric type as the, met the vulnerabilities will fluctuate over time. Uh, and then I registered the metrics using the must register method. Uh, now for this, you can use either, there are several libraries you can use, like the prom auto or prom HTTP library. And then we have the pro metrics processing method in place. For me, it was grabbing the the data from the Kubernetes CRDs. Now, Kubescape had uh, introduced their storage client. So I was uh, supposed to grab the data using a cluster config, which was provided by their storage client, and use them to fetch data from CRDs and uh, expose them over an HTTP server. Now, when it comes to the exporting part, 
for Prometheus to find out that uh, there's an endpoint from where it has to pull metrics from, you can create a new job and uh, set a port for it to look on to. And the result would be something like this, where you can finally have a Grafana dashboard where the metrics are being exported. And thank you. Thank you. And I think we have one last one. Harissa Kesh. Um, doing Wasm. All right. On the server side. What? Wasm on the server. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, hello everyone. I am Rishikesh Rao, a freshly graduated engineer, uh, engineer from India. And I'm pretty inspired to meet fellow programmers here and excited to talk about my project, fast and portable media processing functions using server-side WASM. So I've contributed to the WASM Edge runtime uh, which is part of the Wasamage organization uh, uh, managed by the CNCF Foundation. Wasamage, Wasamage is a WebAssembly runtime providing sandbox functionalities. Uh, the goal was of the project was to integrate FFmpeg plugin into Wasamage to have near native performance to process media applications. The reason for me to uh, select this project was to understand WebAssembly. What is WebAssembly? Is it web? Is it assembly? Uh, I wanted to know what problems it solves and uh, how is it going to fit into the technology space. Also, uh, FFmpeg API is for a beginner is pretty daunting to get started with. Uh, I had to understand what are frames, packets, codecs, everything was new to me and I took that as a challenge to learn it. Also, uh, during my college days, I have never written any production ready code. I've made like small projects here and there, but uh, nothing was used uh, like basically by other users except me. Uh, finally, the Linux Foundation provides mentees an opportunity to present at conferences and I wanted to leverage that to build a personal brand and meet a lot of people. So. To understand what our project does, uh, we have to understand the previous approach which uh, people have taken. So for a, uh, for a Rust user application, if they want to integrate FFmpeg into the web assembly space, they use a third party FFmpeg library and then uh, using that library, they compile their application into the web assembly format. After they compile that uh, into the web assembly file, uh, we use web uh, assembly runtimes to execute those WASM files. Uh, this is a pretty good approach, but not an optimized one. The reasons being build time. To compile the entire F, uh, FFmpeg library into WASM, uh, into a WASM format is not very efficient. We have seen build times taking around 10 to 15 minutes uh, just to you know test what code you have written. Apart from that, uh, the WASMH runtime doesn't support multi-threading, like not only WASMH, the many WASM runtimes don't support multi-threading functionalities, which, uh, you know, FFmpeg normally uses internally. Memory management is one more big issue we have seen. Uh, so the run, uh, run times generally work on linear fixed memory. So it gets pretty uh, difficult to manage such uh, memory uh, management internally and leads to a lot of fragmentation. Finally, hardware acceleration is one more big uh, problem we have, we have uh, seen within the WASM Edge runtime. Uh, we don't have support for AVX, advanced vec vector extensions, uh, which, you know, FFmpeg uses under the hood. So to uh, solve this issue, we have uh, built a WASM Edge FFmpeg library along with a an FFmpeg plugin into the WASM Edge runtime. So what does this do? What does it mean for the user application? So users can now uh, add the WASMH FFmpeg plugin into their uh, library. And then uh, if, they, if they want to process any kind of media, they send that to their library. 
and the library forwards all of that data to the FFmpeg plugin. The FFmpeg plugin securely uh, uh, invokes the FFmpeg C API, which is present on the operating system. Okay, once uh, all the computation is done, the FFmpeg software returns the data back to the plugin, and users get to have near native application uh, performance. A super quick demo as I, uh, we have very little time. So I'll show you, we have, so this is a video application, which is two seconds long and it, is, it runs at 60 FPS, okay? So if you want, uh, we have re, uh, created this, I've created a demo code where we can look at video information. Oh, okay, let me expand this. So here you can see all uh, the video, it contains, it's uh, uh, 120 frames, it contains 120 frames, it's a two second. All of this code written in Rust, uh, compiled uh, using, uh, uh, compiled to Wasm and uh, taking advantage of the FFmpeg software present on the host operating system. Also, we can look at uh, all the frames, we can dump all of the frames present in the video so if I uh, run this code, oh, okay. Yeah, there's a typo, it should be dump frames. So now I compile this code into Watson format and we can look at this code using the tree command. So now we have this Watson file which can be sent onto any any uh, op uh, you know uh, computer and using Watson Edge we can run and execute the FFmpeg software. So if I look at this, I try to look at all the frames present in the video. It's executing and yeah, I get this. I did it in the frames folder. So if I go and reveal it in the Finder. Yeah, I can see all of the 120 frames present in the video. So this is one of it, all of these videos, uh, images together combined to form the video. I'll link, I'll share the link of this project. You can try, there are many more examples here in the example folder. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, the community which has helped me, support me throughout the journey. I'd also thank Wasamage for be, uh, you know, shaping me as a programmer and uh, to change my perspectives on shared learning in the community. Uh, it has been an exciting journey and I'm excited for the future as well. Thank you. Thank you and thank you to all the interns. Big round of applause to all of them. That was a lot of work you guys did. Yeah. And that's it. There's the Tux crawl, Tux, 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 Tux track tonight in I think a half hour. And um, see you there and have a good conference. Thank you very much.